Hello and welcome to The Shooting Show. This week we've got an action-packed show with a foxing outing and a bit later on we'll be stalking with Stuart Ebrol. But first, Mark Ripley's got his hands on the latest Pulsar rifle scope and is keen to test it out on a few foxes. Hello and welcome to another episode of The Shooting Show. This week I'm going to be out this evening using the uh, Thermion rifle scope. This is the Thermion Pro 2 with the laser rangefinder. And uh, I thought what I'd do is very quickly just show you how to um, initially set up your rifle scope, how to mount it and um, just yeah, how to get it set up right before you actually take it out in the field. I'm going to be using my Ticker rifle this evening. This is a Ticker 223. This is a custom built rifle. Um, lovely little rifle, shoots really well. I've got a, um, a thermal scope on there at the moment and I'm using the quick release mounts here from Sports Match. So I can quickly take them off and I can put that scope back on there without losing my zero, which is uh, a nice little feature of these, these mounts. Right, so let's put that to one side and we'll have a look at the Thermion. So as I say, this is the Thermion rifle scope from Pulsar. Bit of an odd looking thing this, I must admit, because you've got that, that large piece on the front here. That there is your rangefinder. But um, nonetheless, it works very nicely. So let's have a look at mounting this. So firstly, as you can see, Rifles bolts open and empty. Got a Picatinny rail already mounted on there. First thing I'm going to do is get another set of mounts. Um, these are again sports match mounts. These are just the one piece set simply because I've actually run out of, uh, of the single piece mounts. So the first thing we're going to want to do is set our mounts on the rail, the bottom half of the mounts on the rail. So what I'm going to do actually is I'm going to put that so that the nut on the mount here is on this side because um, my ejection port is on the left hand side being a left hand rifle. Uh, for right handed users you're going to want to have it the other way around. So I'm just going to put them on there just hand tight for a minute. So the first thing you're going to want to do is make sure your rifle's level. So. I'm going to put a level on there, keeping it square to the action. And being that I'm using a bipod on this, I can just lean that over and clamp it down to where I want that, which is there. I'll just pinch up a little bit. Okay, next thing I'm going to do is lay my scope on there, like so, and then I'm just going to plonk the, uh, the rings on there, the top of the rings. And I'm just going to loosely do those up. The reason I'm doing it loosely is I'm going to want to move this scope around a little bit in the mounts to get it how I want it. Okay. Next thing I do is turn the scope on because I want to make sure I'm getting the right eye relief on this. So okay so that looks that looks pretty good for me. I'm happy with that. The next thing I do is just put that on top of the scope and just pivot that scope so that it's level. There we go. And I'm just going to pinch them up just a little bit. Okay, there we go. That is now locked in place. Now I can just do the rest of the screws up. Just make sure they're all pinched up. So I'm just going to go around, tighten them down as evenly as possible by just pinching each one up. 
I'll just keep doing that until they're all pinched up tight. And once I've done that, I'm just going to take a screwdriver and just pinch these up. And there you go, that's a very quick, simple way of mounting a rifle scope. That's how I do it. A lot of people have their own different uh, methods of doing that, but that's how I like to do them. There you go. Right. Now that's all set up, I'll turn that off so I don't waste any, oh, this button, so I don't waste any power. And uh, we're all set to go out and have a look for a fox this evening. Right, so I've just arrived down at one of my local farms. Um, I'm going to put a target out in this field here, just quickly zero the rifle, and then uh, we're good to get out and do a bit of foxing. Okay, right, so we're just over 50 metres away, so we've set the target up and get, uh, get shooting. So that's a good start, we're on the target. And I think that's just low, but I'm gonna quickly just go and check. Oh yeah, so there's our hit just there. Just at the bottom of the target, so just need to bring it up and uh, maybe just slightly over to the left as well. Right. All right, so that's a bit more central. Slightly low and slightly to the right, but not to worry, that's near enough. So I'll move that out to 100 meters now and uh, get final zero. Okay, so. You can see I was just a little bit off centre with this shot. So what I did was I put a thermal target on there, which was over the top of that. As you can see, that's hit that right next to uh, my original point of aim. So basically we're zeroed at 100 metres, so we're, uh, we're good to go. So we're going to uh, head off and meet Gary now, our mate, and um, we're going to go and have a look around one of his farms, which is going to be lambing soon. So uh, we're going to see if we can form one or two foxes on there. So this is one of the valleys that they're going to be lambing in a bit later in the year. So uh, it's pretty windy up here. In fact, it's, it's probably 20 to 30 mile an hour winds at the moment. So uh, yeah, it's not ideal conditions. And where we're shooting at the moment, we're quite near the coast. So um, this is uh, blowing straight down the uh, down the valley, straight off the sea. So yeah, a bit cold, but anyway, I'm gonna have a walk down into this valley and see if I can uh, see, a, see a fox. So uh, I'll just spot one right up on the top of the hill there, but I'm not going to get over to that in time. It's heading over towards the road at the top. So I'll give that one a miss. Um, but yeah, they're obviously about, so I'll drop down to the bottom of this valley, I think, try and get out of the wind.
Well, that was an interesting one. I spotted that fox, he was down by the fence line, just to my left here. And um, I had seen him, I don't know where he came from, I just looked around and suddenly he was there. He was probably about 100 yards away. And uh, I got onto him and he'd already spotted me. He was looking straight in my direction. I think he must have winded me because the wind's blowing straight that way. And uh, he, uh, yeah, he was looking like he was gonna, was gonna scoot. So, I mean, I, I didn't clamp the rifle down the tripod like I should have done, but uh, I got onto him and the wind was just not coming around a little bit. And I should really have waited uh, for a better opportunity or got a bit more steady, but I kind of rushed the shot and took it anyway. And uh, I don't know if I missed it or what, I haven't been down and looked yet, but the fox ran anyway. And it ran down to the bottom corner of the field, and then it ran to the right along the hedge right, or along the uh, fence line there. So I got onto it and I could see through the scope that it had like a heat source on the back. And I wasn't sure if maybe I'd hit it low in the back, uh, in the back end, or whether it was just mange. So uh, I tracked it in the scope and then took a running shot at it. And um, fortunately, I managed to bolt it over with the first shot um, and then just gave it one more just to quickly um, put it down. So that's the um, fox that I just shot that was on the run there. Uh, I don't want to handle it too much, but that's a dog fox. But you can see it's got a big patch of mange on the back there. In fact, it's covered with mange and it's in a pretty poor condition. But um, that was obviously what I saw and wasn't sure if it was uh, if it was injured, but um, I'm not quite sure where I hit that, but possibly in the chest there. But um, yeah, it was enough to, uh, to bowl that over and um, stop it going anywhere. So that's a good one to get out of the way because that's just the sort of fox that likes to take lambs. one down. <laughs> certainly, certainly quite busy up here tonight, that's for sure. That one was about, uh, probably about 100 metres, bang on I should think. Um, I saw that probably two or 300 yards out and uh, I gave it a squeak and came in lovely, came charging in. So, excellent. Right. We have a look back up the top of the bank there because uh, I was pretty sure there was another one up there earlier. Up on the sheep there, so we will come and have a look. There's a the fox as well. I'll see if I can get a bit closer. said by the size of that boy he's got to be a boy and he is that's a quite a lump of a fox that beautiful condition oh he's quite heavy too lovely fox
another fog stop on the bank here. It's a little way off, but let's see if I can squeak him in. Hey! Hey! It's five foxes down for two and a half hours out. That's not bad at all. But um, we've certainly seen a lot of foxes out this evening. There must have been 10, 15 foxes, I should think I've seen this evening. Uh, admittedly, we're on a, a sort of um, a quite an open bit of ground. You can see for a long, long distance down through the valley. But even so, that's still a lot of foxes for one area. But um, that's five less for tonight anyway, though. So I hope you've enjoyed the show. And be sure to subscribe. And thanks for watching. Not bad going at all there. Next up, we're heading to the Midlands where Warwickshire Wild and Game have an estate management plan to meet. It's up to Stuart Ebrol to get out on the ground and to thin out the numbers of Muntjac, Rowe and Fallow. Hi, I'm Stuart Ebrol from Warwickshire Wild Game. Welcome to the shooting show. Today, we're at the estate where Warwickshire Wild Game is based. We've got Muntjac, Rowe and Fallow on here. Um, we've, uh, we've done our management plan. Um, so we're gonna try and get out today and uh, find some deer to, uh, to sort of tick off the list. Um, just run through the kit that I'm using today. So we are using a Sauer 202, good trusty rifle. Uh, it's calibred in 308 uh, and we are using Hornady um, 150 grain SSTs. Uh, really, really good round, uh, quite quick. Um, Gives a nice flat trajectory for a 308. Um, bullet retention is really good uh, and does just drop them on the spot. Uh, on top of my Sauer, I've got a Shirovsky Z6i. Um, 56 mm objective lens. Um, a lot of a lot of the fallow stalking his first or last light. Um, so every bit of light gathering capability that you can have is, is crucial. Um, we are using the Leica GeoVids 8x56s. These are the HCRs, so they've got the built-in rangefinder. Um, they're a little bit cumbersome, a little bit heavy, um, a little bit like their owner. Um, but again, with a 56mm, just gathers light really well, allows you to identify deer early or late on. Um, and to help spot them, we are using a Pulsar Helion 2 XP50 Pro. Um, this is an absolute fantastic bit of kit. Uh, for a deer manager, deer management purposes, it is fantastic. The amount of time it saves you scanning through woodland, scanning up against woodland. You know, you can stand there with your binos for 15 minutes and not find a deer tucked in cover with this 15 seconds and you found it and it'll allow you to get on your binos or get on your rifle and start making making decisions and assessments of that deer to see if it's the right one and see if it's the one you want to go after so yeah absolutely invaluable um don't go anywhere without it crucial bit of kit absolutely crucial bit of kit um we are using the viper flex quad sticks um makes transforms shooting with a rifle you can't you can't get a more stable platform platform stood up um, a lot of time now especially with game covers and people uh, farmers looking at cover crops more as an option over winter um, shooting over and into those into those cover crops you couldn't do it prone and you'd really struggle doing it with anything other than quad sticks so these are these are a fantastic tool and again, I don't go anywhere without. Um, I think that is about all the kit we're using. So uh, time's ticking on now. We're getting to sort of that golden hour. So uh, we'll get on and see if we can find something. So what we've got. 15, 20 yards into that wood. There's a couple of row. Um, I can see them in the thermal. Can't 
can't quite see him in the binos. Um, fortunately, there's not really a way of getting into a shooting distance uh, without being seen. Um, they look like they're grazing left-handed. So we're just gonna let them move off for a minute. There is a ride out to the left. Um, so we might be able to get round and see if we can catch some crossing. It's a game strip up through the middle of that maze and if I move left handed I'd probably be able to see up there and potentially get a shot. The issue is that with the fallow to my right, if we move they might pick us up and potentially uh, bump the, the mud jack as well. So. I think we're just going to have to sit and see what comes to us. Ollie, down on the edge of the maze, man. Can you see it? Are you on it, Ollie?
was on it. Ollie was on it. I didn't know Ollie was on it. So unfortunately, we missed an opportunity there. at the top of this plantation ground falls away then rises up on the left hand side there and I actually saw three row and two muntjac coming down the opposite wood and if we'd have come down nipped through this little ride here we'd have been 100 150 yards of those those uh, row of muntjac it's always the case when you're sort of busting to get into a position to get on deer that you've already seen you've always just got to keep vigilant that something else isn't isn't coming out on you and it's the exact what we've just had so just coming down this track other side of the valley i've had a fallow pricket now this fallow pricket um i've been after him for quite a while obviously there's a pheasant shoot here um uh, game covers are a huge part of that uh, and we've had this fallow pricket um sort of consistently smashing up maize um, which obviously has been affecting the, the pheasants and how they move. So, a bit of a bit of a rush, um, a bit of a quick one. Ollie was quick on the camera, but we managed to um, managed to get a nice shot in and uh, and uh, drop him on the spot. Um, again, quad sticks. Uh, if I'd have had to drop to the ground there and get on the bipod and take a shot probably with the vegetation probably wouldn't have managed it um but quick deployment straight on him uh and yeah job done it's a little bit a little bit further uh, than i'd have liked uh, but again great great equipment great quad sticks you know again i've been using this rifle for eight nine years i know what the bullets are doing i know what they're doing at those ranges and and uh, yeah it's worked effectively Let's go and have a look.
as you can see, um, he dropped, he dropped on the shot. Um, how he'd come out, come out from this corner. And we were coming down the track. You know, he'd made us. He was square onto us. Um, so I took a took a low neck shot. Um, which is the reason why he dropped on the spot. Um, just come up, bled him. Just get any excess blood out. And what we'll probably do is we'll uh, we're on the we're on the estate where I have my processing unit. So. What we'll probably do is go back, go back to the larder, uh, get my quad bike, and we'll do a uh, a proper gralic in uh, in the larder. Um, but yeah, really nice animal, in great condition. Um, like I said, he's the one that's been uh, causing the gamekeeper a bit of grief, um, breaking up game covers. So uh, I'll definitely be in his good books for a change. Um, so yeah. Nice one to take out. Happy, nice shot. Now the uh, now the work starts. So, um, obviously, we set out after after row. Uh, but as stalking goes, uh, you sort of got to roll with it. Um, this guy is one that we've known about. You can see for the size of him, the quality of his head is nowhere near where it should be. Um, he's also been pretty destructive in the maize crops. So um, definitely one we wanted to take out and the opportunity arose when we were trying to get round onto some row. Um, so I thought it was better to take him than try and stalk into the row. We've uh, we've removed his his uh, his legs. We've got him back um, into my grolicin part of the processing unit. Um, I've already been and done his bumhole, so when when we come through, I can pull that straight through and uh, yeah go through the grolic like normal. Right, so that's uh, that's another day done. Um, we've had a successful afternoon. Uh, a bit tricky at the start, they were all still tight in cover. We've had uh, quite a few days of pretty bad rain, um, so it's uh, it's made the job pretty tricky. But we managed to get the job done today and get this lovely lovely animal on the ground. Um, this will be going into the Warwickshire Wild Game chiller um, and be out for all the orders for next week, uh, pubs, restaurants or the retail orders online. Um, I'd like to thank you very much for watching and uh, hopefully we'll see you again soon. Some great shooting there as always. Sadly, that's all we've got time for this week on this episode of The Shooting Show. Make sure you like and subscribe for more videos. And if you're not a member of BASC, now's the time to join. My name's Chris Castle and this has been The Shooting Show. If you aren't a member of BASC, it's time to join now. BASC, looking after your sport, looking after you.